So let's talk about our interactive and strategic problems for week seven. So these are all themed around energy. So we'll be drawing a lot of energy bar diagrams. So for example, let's look at the first interactive problem. We have a disc sliding on frictionless ice comes to a one meter high hill. So the height of this hill is one meter. My question is, will it make it to the top? So a kind of edge case where it like just barely makes it to the top would be the box coming to a stop right up there. So if I'm drawing some bar diagrams here, then to start with, I have some amount of kinetic energy at the start. I'm also gonna be interested in gravitational potential energy. And this is where choosing an origin is important. I'll say that H equals zero corresponds to the bottom of the hill. So then I have no gravitational potential energy here. And then at the top of the hill, I have gravitational potential energy. And depending on how fast I'm going, I may or may not have kinetic energy when I get up there. If we're looking at the edge case and I only barely have any kinetic energy or maybe I even have no kinetic energy. So the energy I have before I reach the hill is gonna be like one half mv squared. So V is four meters per second, square that 16. So I've got about 16 joules of energy multiplied by two, divide by two. So then the question is, is 16 joules of energy enough to reach a certain height? So I've got 16 joules of energy is equal to my gravitational potential energy of M times G times height. Mass is uh, two kilograms, G is around about 10. So I've got around 20 kilogram meters per second times H. So the maximum height that I can reach in this case is going to be 16 joules over 20, which is going to be less than one meter. So no, I certainly cannot reach the top of the hill. And it does not depend on the length or angle of the hill in this case, because we have no friction. So we don't worry about any external forces like friction, meaning that we can really lean on the real strength of using this conservation of energy approach, which is that we only really care about the initial and final state of the system. Okay, so let's examine now dropping a mass onto a spring. And I'm going to do the same sort of bar diagram I did before. So to start with, I've got a certain amount of gravitational potential energy. I've got no spring potential energy and I'm released from rest. So I also have no kinetic energy. Afterwards, I have gravitational potential energy. I've got spring potential energy and I may or may not have kinetic energy. So I definitely have some spring potential energy here. So here's the question. What kinds, what forms of energy do I have at the beginning of the experiment? Well, I think I'm only going to really have gravitational potential energy. So, uh, oops, I'm gonna have to edit this problem here. When you see it, you should see the correct one. Which of these have decreased by the end of the experiment? Um, so by the end of the experiment, that gravitational energy has decreased. The other two have stayed the same. Again, gonna have to make an edit here before you guys all see this. Um, which of the following have increased by the end of the experiment? Well, that's only going to end up being experiment three, thinking about energy. So in this case, a lot of our interactive problems have to do with work. So work is a scalar quantity that is made up of vectors. So to find work, we have to right, take the dot product of the force and the displacement vector. So that dot product is a way of combining two vectors. And one way we can think about it is it's gonna be the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement 
times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. So in the case of object one, or problem one rather, the force is going to be towards the center of the circle. And I know that because if my object is moving in uniform circular motion, then the net force has to be providing a centripetal acceleration. So that means my force is going to always be perpendicular to my velocity, meaning that at each moment I'm moving up a little bit, but my force is always at a right angle to the way I'm moving. So that means the angle between these two things is perpetually 90 degrees. And cosine of 90 degrees is zero, meaning that there is no work being done on this block by the string. So this is either very simple or a little bit tricky depending on how you think about it. Um, if I just look at each individual block, the force and the displacement are in the same direction. So the work done on each block is positive. So the work done on C is positive and the work done on D is positive. Therefore, the total work being done on this block by me is positive. So the reason why this could sometimes be tricky is the temptation is to say, well, there's a force being done to the right and a force being done to the left so that somehow these two works cancel each other out. Um, but what we have to remember here is work is a scalar. So I don't actually have a sense of direction when I'm talking about work. So work to the left and work to the right doesn't really mean anything. I instead am just thinking about work as a number. So when I get a positive work for each of these, then I must have a positive total work being done. And the change in energy, right? The network being done being positive tells me that the energy change should also be positive. And so we can imagine that if there's no friction on this table and I'm pushing these blocks, they're going to be picking up some speed. And so my work is being converted into kinetic energy. This is actually a little bit easier to see when I add the spring in for the next two questions, because now it's easier to visualize these two objects as being one, or these three objects as being in the same connected system. So again, the force and displacement for each of these is parallel and the Network is positive, so that means the change in energy should also be positive. In this case, my network is corresponding to a change in energy, and the energy I'm gaining in this case is spring potential energy. So I'm doing work on the system in order to store energy in the spring. Okay, so let's look at the uh, strategic problem for this week. So a small box is launched from rest by a compressed spring slides down the track on a hill, comes to rest at distance D. Kinetic friction between the box and the track is negligible on the hill, but exists on the horizontal part of the bottom of the track. So find the distance D, travel down the track. Okay, so what do I include in the system? So I've got the block and the spring as part of my system, right? So, what are my main concepts? Well, I have my work energy theorem, right? So I'm gonna start off with a certain amount of energy and the energy that's remaining, or the energy that I've lost has to have gone somewhere. So I'm also gonna have work done by an external force, or by friction in this case. I'm gonna have some spring potential energy and some gravitational potential energy. I'm going to include the earth in my system. You know what? The system I'm going to say is going to be earth block spring. So what's the information we've got? Well, most of it's actually written up here, right? So I probably need to know the height as well. Right, I need to know the total distance traveled at the bottom of the track. Um, I don't know the mass of the object. So I just know the position of everything. I know the spring constant. So let's set up some equations for the initial and final energy, as well as the work done.
So a final quantity I'm solving for is going to be the distance traveled horizontally on the track. It's going to be in meters. Predicting the order of magnitude is a little bit tricky. Right, I'm launched down spring, so I'm falling a distance of, say, like, that's going to be around about a meter. Right, so I'm probably going a few meters per second, but I don't know how big my friction equation is. So, yeah, let's take a look here. So I'm, I probably don't expect it to go more than one meter, really, on the track. Okay, so let's annotate this with, um, let's annotate this. We've got some initial energy corresponding to the stored energy in the spring. We've got some energy originally in the spring. We've got some energy in gravitational PE. And to start with, we've got no kinetic energy until the spring, until the ball it blocks is launched from the spring. At the end, we've got nothing left in the spring. If this is corresponding to my h equals zero, then I've got nothing left in gravity and I've got nothing in kinetic energy. So I've got no energy left at the end of the day. So all the energy I start the problem with, well, that's all gone. Okay, so that means I'm going to be thinking about the equations I need corresponding to the initial energy being that one half kx squared plus mass times g times the height of the block. My final energy is zero. So the work done by friction is going to be equal to the change in energy, which is going to correspond to final energy minus initial energy, or negative one half kx squared minus mgh. So the work done by the system, or the work done by friction, is going to be this loss in energy. Uh, the work done by friction is also going to correspond to right, the force due to friction times the distance. That's going to be equal to, well, so really negative force of friction times distance. Yeah, so if I am in the process of sliding along this guy here, the friction force is going to be slowing me down. So the work done by that friction force is going to be negative. So the negative force times the distance traveled, that's going to correspond to negative one half kx squared minus mgh. I don't know the height, but I do know that the height is going to be equal to the distance traveled along the ramp times the sine of the angle there. Oop, not D, I'm using D for something else. Um, the length of the ramp here, so I'll call that maybe Further, I'm going to need to break up the force of friction into the coefficient of friction times the, yes, if I want to find a distance d, I need to know the total friction force. So that's going to be the negative coefficient of friction times the normal force times the distance d. So in this case, when I'm on the horizontal plane here, Right, my normal force and my weight of my block 
should be equal because I'm not accelerating in the y direction. So I could write that as negative times the coefficient of kinetic friction times mg times distance. It's going to be negative 1 half times k x squared minus mg l sine theta. All right, so now I'm going to put in some numbers and figure out what my distance is going to be. Okay, so my answer was around 5.8 meters. That was a few times bigger than I expected. I expected more like a meter, but yeah, it still seems pretty reasonable. Um, so again, right, we're working on conservation of energy and we're looking at the work done by an external force when the energy changes. All right, I'll talk to you next week.